Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hillary Carter. I'm VP of Research at the Linux Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us at Research Insights Revealed, our session to dig into the findings of the Europe uh, 2022 Spotlight Report. Uh, I am joined by a distinguished panel, uh, Colin Eberhardt, uh, who is from ScottLogic, CEO, who uh, with his team led the authorship and qualitative uh, research into some analytics specific to the report. Sachiko Mudo, chairman of Open Forum Europe, who uh, with her uh, colleague Aster Numlin Karlberg, who was originally supposed to join us today, participated as survey distribution partner and advisor really on uh, the project from the very beginning and supported this effort. And of course, LF Europe's new GM, Gabriele Colombro, who is the original gangster um, for <laughs> this project. He is the inspiration for the report. He said, we must conduct a research study in order for LF Europe to be successful. So with Gab's inspiration, I really had no choice <laughs> but, but, to, but to do this. Anyway, I'm so pleased that we did. So um, I will kick off our discussion by briefly introducing the methodology behind the research, and then I'll invite Colin up to discuss the findings, Sachiko to discuss uh, research that they've done at Open Forum Europe and its significance to the European open source ecosystem. And then Gab, how will come up to describe um, and solicit input from you on how we can leverage this insight to influence programming and um, create a flourishing, or run, not create, sustain a flourishing open source ecosystem. So the methodology, as for those of you who are part of the keynote, uh, we launched a survey at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con um, in Valencia, Spain in May. Our survey was distributed by 15 partner organizations, many of them from the academic community. Uh, Collins organization, Scott Logic, a tech consultancy based in the UK, uh, incubators uh, and, and other entities. We had a terrific uh, distribution, a lot of support for this effort. And through their partnership, we were able to reach um, a tremendous cross-section across the European continent, really try um, our very best to get a robust, diverse survey sample. It's not always that easy, and so we're very grateful anytime we have a community who gets behind a research project and helps in this effort. And so, uh, again, I want to thank everybody who participated in sharing the survey. We also had a, a great response of uh, survey um, takers. Um, so. Uh, among our academic partners, code, uh, not Komosha, but um, leading technical universities and developer community partners included Codemotion, uh, Technology University at Eindhoven, uh, TU Berlin, and the To Do Groups Europe chapter. Our screening criteria was you couldn't be a bot. You had to have, you had to, you had to not be screened out of the bot questions. It is hard, yeah. You had to pick the correct one of, you know, maybe five or six responses. <laughs> we got a lot of, of bounces, consequently. Um, you had to be a resident of Europe, at least part-time employed, because the questions were um, related to organizational uh, consumption and contribution policies and practices, for the most part. Um, and you, w we also filtered out those responses uh, who were not sure when it came to their employer's approach uh, to open source. In terms of survey sample, we had 1,050 survey starts, 750 completed the consumption questions, and 670 respond respondents completed the survey from beginning to end. So we had enough of a sample size that we could do some interesting analytics, particular to industry or uh, country, um, and so on. And also, sorry, 16 interviews with subject matter experts across the continent. Um, we're really grateful anytime individuals are willing to not only participate in an interview, but to do so on the record. So that was how we approached uh, the survey and the report empirical research process. And now I'd like to invite Colin Eberhardt up to go through the key findings. Thanks for that, Hilary. Okay, so I've got the challenge of condensing a 40-page report with 30 diagrams into a 
10 minute slot. So, you know, hold on to your seats. This is going to be fast. Now, I, I, as you can imagine, I'm only going to be able to give you a little bit of a taster of the contents of the report. I'm basically going to pull on a single thread that, that, that weaves its way through the, the narrative. So that's just one thread. There are a number of stories that emerge throughout the report. I'm going to talk a little bit about consumption, uh, a little bit about contribution. So again, I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with these terms, but sometimes they require explaining. So consumption, using open source, contribution, giving back or creating your own open source project. Then we're going to take a bit of a step back and look at a view across Europe, across just one of these dimensions. Another area we're going to focus on a little bit is open source leadership. I know that's important to a great many people. And then finally, I'll share the, the, the most sort of uh, compelling conclusions of the report. So let's start with consumption. And as I mentioned, this is just one of the survey questions and one of the views. So what you see on this, this, um, on this slide is we asked a question uh, about the consumption policy of the individual's employer. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the five different response options. The response option at the top is the most permissive. They're actively encouraged to consume open source. The next is they are, wow, this screen is tiny, so I'm gonna have to guess. The next is that they are uh, permitted to consume open source under some limiting conditions. Next, no clear policy, and then finally down to don't know, not sure. So it's, it's effectively a sliding scale of how permissive it is. We were fortunate, as Hillary mentioned, that we had a, a, a sizable number of survey respondents, which allowed us to segment the data in various different interesting ways. So here we're segmenting by the size of the organization that they are employed at, with the smallest, the micro businesses on the left hand side, and the largest, typically multinational corporations on the right hand side. And the pattern you can see is, is quite apparent. Within the smallest of organizations, 80% of individuals said that they're actively encouraged to consume open source. And as the size of their organization increases, that percentage decreases. Interestingly, for the most part, that data almost flows into the next level down, whereby consumption is permitted under limiting con limited conditions or limiting conditions. This is as you'd expect. Any large organization will probably have legal compliance concerns and so on, which will result in those limitations. What I also find quite interesting here is, is the third bar down, the no clear policy. Where we find policy lacking is not at the two extremes, the micro, the very large ent enterprises, it's the SMEs and the, the, the sort of mid-sized businesses where 20% and 18% respectively say there is no clear policy. So this is, to me, is a clear signal that medium-sized businesses need to work on policy clarity in, in open source consumption. If we look at the other side of the coin, contribution, again, we asked a very similar question. We asked uh, about the... Um, the uh, employer's policy uh, relating to open source consumption, uh, sorry, contribution. Here, what we can see on the vertical axis as, is a very similar sort of uh, sliding scale from being openly encouraged to the far end where it's not permitted or don't know, not sure. This time, we're segmenting by industry sector. And I, I probably don't have to point it out. The, the trend almost jumps off the page. What you're finding is, information technology, professional um, technical services, telecommunication, contribution is openly encouraged in a number of these organizations. With other sectors, public sector, education, and the one that I can't read, oh, finance, oh, naughty finance. I, I work in finance, tut tut. Those are the ones where you know, contribution's not encouraged, and I think anyone who's worked in those sectors knows that that, that, that is the case. Interestingly, that all pushes into no clear policy. In these organizations, um, whether people feel that they would like to contribute or not, they simply don't know whether they are able to. Uh, it, it really shows a sort of lack of maturity in policy in these, in these sectors as a whole. Then if we take a bit of a step back. Again, we, we were able to look at industry sector, organization size, and country. So here we can see a combination of a few different survey questions. What we're doing is, uh, one of the questions we asked is, how, in, how important, how significant is open source to your sector? And as you can imagine, a great many of the respondents said, yes, it's important to my sector. Then we're looking at how permissive their consumption policy is and contribution policy. And finally, we're looking at how this, uh, how this is uh, 
uh, across various different countries within Europe. And you can see, for example, Spain is a bit of an outlier here. Um, one of the things I find actually quite interesting is the Netherlands. Uh, they've got quite permissive consumption policies, but when it comes to contribution, there's a significant drop there. And, and again, one of the things that jumps off the page to me here is the downward slope. Everyone says it's valuable. A smaller number say consumption's encouraged and an ever, an ever smaller number say contribution is encouraged. The, the, throughout a number of our, our survey questions, this imbalance between consumption and contribution was quite apparent. Uh, we can see 43% report a lack of contribution policy compared with 20% reporting a lack of clear consumption policy. And again, lack of clarity is something that really frustrates me because um, that's something that's potentially quite easy to address. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about open source leadership and, uh, and it's quite relevant to this event. I know one of the parallel tracks here is OSPOCON. And again, this screen is far too small for me to read it. So one of the fantastic quotes I had from Alois is, a central role is the OSP of the OSPO is to relate the value to the business as a whole, not just in the way the CTO can understand. It's, it's, it's about uh, conveying the, the, the value of open source to a non-technical audience because as you saw in the previous slide, many of these sectors, uh, a, but a significant number of their, their employees wouldn't consider themselves to be technical. And they all need to understand the value of open source. So that's a very important role of, of an OSPO. One of the things that we were quite clear about in our, in our survey though, was we didn't just want to single out organizations with an OSPO. We also wanted to acknowledge that in some organizations, they have clear and visible leadership, which to my mind, uh, provides a similar kind of guidance that an OSPO would. This is something that you may see present in perhaps smaller organizations or organizations that are evolving towards having an OSPO. So let's have a look at what leadership does to some of the data. So here, if we look at, which one's this? I'm gonna have to look over there because this screen's tiny. Which one was this? Was this contribution or consumption? Ah, consumption, okay. So what we've got now is we uh, are splitting the responses uh, around consumption policy based on whether they have an OSPO or clear and visible leader or whether they don't. And again, I probably don't need to point it out. When there is an OSPO or a clear leader, consumption is much more encouraged than when it is absent. And also, the one that bugs me time and time again, a lack of policy. As you can see, those with an OSPO or leadership, the number of people that reported a lack of clear policy is much smaller than when it is absent. So to me, this is a clear indicator that, that leadership is a must. Whether it's an OSPO or not, leadership has a significant uh, impact on the employee experience. And the employees are the ones that are going to consume and contribute at the end of the day. Another one. I'm going to lean over here. Okay, this is about um, their ah, the value, the perceived value derived from open source. So we we, we asked them, it, do you see the the perceived value of open source increasing or decreasing for your organisation? As you can imagine, uh, across the board, most people were quite um, optimistic and said yes, the value is increasing. However, in the presence of an OSPO or clear visible leader the value increase was much greater than when it was absent. 64% said it increased uh, versus 39% in organizations that lack that leadership. Again, another fantastic result demonstrating the need for leadership. So finally, if we move on to the conclusions, as I said, I've just pulled on a single sort of strand throughout the, um, throughout the report. So the first thing that I, I want to highlight is um, uh, some of the things that we need to take home and, and act upon ourselves is firstly, we definitely need to address the imbalance between consumption and contribution, uh, contribution. And I personally think the way to do this is through policy clarity. We need to address those areas, especially in telecommunications, especially in public sector and finance, where a significant number of the respondents said, I, I, I don't know, the policy is not clear. Or I just don't know what it is. I mean, I'm hoping that those businesses understand the value of consuming and contributing. If all they need to do is improve their policy, they can get a really big win here. The next one is, I think, the obvious thing, the obvious route to creating clarity is through leadership. I, mean, I don't need to bang the drum on that one any further. The results speak for themselves. 
there are some other conclusions, and all I'm going to do is say you're going to have to read the report to find out why. Um, encourage public sector investment in open source. In almost every question that we asked, public sector was an outlier, and I don't mean an outlier in a good way. I mean an outlier in a, oh, that's not so good. Um, one of the things that's quite apparent within, within Europe is there are a number of countries where open source is mandated within public sector organisations. Um, unfortunately, our, result, our survey findings are, indicate that there's, there's a lack of policy, there's a lack of contribution, there's some consumption. Ba basically, policy is, is not resulting in a significant sort of impact, to my mind. So I think the public sector as a whole really needs to sort out um, it, uh, open source. And finally, I think the final point is almost about the goal that we should be seeking to achieve. We should be embracing open source as a mechanism for apolitical collaboration and shared value creation. This is why it's an open source Europe report. Um, open source is a fantastic platform for achieving that goal. Download the report. <laughs> there we go. Oh, sorry. I thought, I thought we were so convincing they'd have downloaded it already. Cool, thank you very much. I'll pass on. Uh, no, we take questions afterwards. So I'll now uh, ask Sachiko Muto of Open Forum Europe to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary. And I, I, I did read the report, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't think that you read our report. Um, and I'm saying that because, you know, your report was very, uh, very a very nice read. Uh, our report was, I think, 400 plus pages. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I just have to, yeah, okay. Right, so I can move on. Everybody has, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so as Hilary also mentioned, I'm actually stepping in for my colleague, uh, Astrid Nimlin Karlberg, who couldn't be here. Um, but that's fine, because I also lived through, uh, you know, this, this report uh, for, for about a year, year's time. And so um, I think I should give a little bit of context to uh, this report, because it's quite different from, from how your report came about, I think. Which, uh, um, this report was actually put out to competitive tender by the European Commission. Um, and so we, uh, together with Fraunhofer, um, oh, I should have introduced us, but I'm just going to jump to the report. Um, so it was put out to tender by the Commission, and Fraunhofer and OFE together responded to this call for tender. And so we have delivered this, this report for the Commission. Um, and so it's published by the Commission, but it's authored by us. And um, you can also download the report. Um, but indeed, like this is a 400 page plus report. And that's also because we did not necessarily have control over the, the um, uh, you know, what went into the report. It was quite a, a, a sort of um, uh, a strict specification that comes from, from, uh, from the commission itself. I think that's important to understand because it came from, from DG Connect and they wanted to understand the value of, uh, of open source, uh, the economic uh, uh, value to, of open source to, to European economy. Um, and so um, it's pretty clear from the start, and I'm sharing a little bit of background information, that they wanted a, a reason to, to go in and you know, maybe formulate policies around open source and whatever, but they needed to have the justification for that. So it was really important for them that we come to a number and we did come to numbers, and I hesitate to put up this next slide because, um, indeed, uh, uh, the other partner in the project um, uh, was um, led by uh, an economics professor, actually a professor of econometrics, and so it's his model that I'm presenting, and I do not have a PhD in econ econometrics, but what the commission wanted was a, defend, you know, a, a figure that could be defended, and so what I'm presenting here is actually a quite impressive number, uh, estimating um, sort of the annual contribution of open source to the European economy, and it's a modest number. Um, I don't want to go into sort of the details of how that, you know, you can read the annex um, that I think adds 100 pages to, <laughs> to our study, but I think uh, suffices to say that the, the, the European Commission was happy to have this, and that then this, um, having this foundation, would then lead uh, them to sort of look into what sorts of policies could could 
could uh, could uh, further enable the European economy to 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 sort of capitalize on on on, on the benefits that open source provides. So. Um, I, uh, and you know, you see a, a figure of sort of, um, for a, the year 2017, 2018, they estimate this number to be 63 billion euros or something like that. And the interesting thing that the model also allows for is that further investment, uh, you know, would, would, you know, would bring additional, um, additional value. Um, and, you know, we also had a sort of qualitative uh, part of our, uh, our study. Uh, also a num uh, survey, but also a number of in-depth interviews as well. Um, we were also required to come up with um, a number of policy recommendations. And it's interesting because for me, I see your uh, presentation and I'm actually more interested in, in discussing that because the, what was achieved with this was to say, yes, it's important for European policymakers to care about open source and to, pr you know, and to promote and encourage uh, European businesses and, and public sector organizations to further invest in open source. Now, in order to understand how we actually formulate good policies, we do need the sort of survey, you know, the sort of um, reports that, that you have, um, that you have come, you know, presented today. So I'm, I'm really interested in taking that next step now, uh, understanding what are some of the blockers, what are some of the opportunities. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that we came to a very similar conclusion, actually, which was um, because this, our study, even though it was um, uh, sort of initiated by the European Commission, the, did not have an exclusive um, um, focus on the public sector, actually. They wanted to understand the, you know, how it affected you know, European businesses, SMEs, uh, etc. But you know, our recommendation was also that the public sector needed to invest more um, into uh, under further understanding uh, open source, and we made a parallel with sort of um, with standardization uh, in Europe, which actually has, uh, if you look at the European Commission, has several units in the Commission with people working on standardization policy, etc., and so basically making the point that if you want to understand and benefit from, from something, you have to um, build a sort of institutional um, capacity. And so, you know, OSPOs were mentioned, and um, this is obviously something that's happening also in the public sector. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, one of the recommendations that we made as well, this importance of leadership and having clear policies in order to benefit from, from from open source and, and to formulate good policies around it. And policies now, uh, you know, when you talk about from a sort of politics point of view, it's not just sort of internal policies, it's also external uh, policies. And so um, that's basically, um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to talk about our report. Uh, for us, it was really about sort of setting the stage for more in-depth uh, research, which, um, you know, um, Happy to see that you're you're initiating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Saj. Thank you so much, Gab. Please. Over to you, good man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I actually am really curious to see what you guys, um, the panelists as well, and the audience, of course, think about the next slides because. Um, I think um, when we were reviewing the report with with uh, Hillary, I, you know, I kind of got a copy of the report and I was like, you know, why don't we change this? Why don't we change that? And Hillary said, hey, how about we keep sort of separate the research part from you can write your, you know, foreword and your, you know, inspirational whatever Italian blah blah blah, uh, but we'll keep the research research. Uh, and so what you see here is my interpretation of the research which i'm actually curious to you know for you guys to challenge because you've you know mine has been a i'm not gonna say a skim read but uh, it's been only a couple of days processing this so feel free to you know jump at me i mean not physically but um so uh, this is like the you had skipped, uh, uh, Colin, but I <laughs> decided to borrow it uh, just to sort of start setting the stage. This is one of the other sort of takeaways. I'm going to start with a, key, a couple of key takeaways from my side and then how we 
start applying those takeaways. As Hilary said, one of the reasons for this research was, um, you know, as we launch LF Europe, I have the luxury of being able to do it on a data-driven basis, which is something that I was never been able to do, <laughs> never been able to do before. So um, it was interesting to me to see how, as Colin hinted to, you know, the value of open source is widely recognized, not just in the public sector. Clearly, the public sector has uh, sort of shown uh, sort of the, the most value um, amongst the respondents. But, you know, even uh, industries like, you know, finance, which I'm pretty familiar with, still well over 50%, which is uh, uh, definitely, you know, encouraging. But certainly, it, it talks to the sort of general understanding of, of the potential of open source towards innovation. Um, so that's one of the takeaways. Then I've taken some of the takeaways that were shared this morning during the, the keynote. And of course, I love that if you read the report, uh, you'll know more. Um, but there were a couple of, uh, a couple of results that I tried to sort of put together into some, something actionable. Um, as we said in the previous slides, open source is, is widely recognized as, as sort of across industries, across countries. Yes, as Colin pointed out, there is a sort of difference in sort of how the different countries when we sort of break it down to country. But, you know, they were all, you know, even Italy. It's actually, you know, well over 60, 60 70 percent. And so um, despite some variance, generally even across countries and regions, sorry, industries and countries, um, I didn't see a major difference there. Um, what, what struck me that we actually didn't discuss today is that um, some of the results suggest that the primary reason why, especially the public sector, looks at uh, um, open source, um, you know, it all starts with sort of cost cutting, unsurprisingly, and, and sort of vendor locking prevention was um, a major um, result, especially comparatively to other uh, uh, regions uh, or other studies that we've done. For example, uh, um, you know, in other areas, innovation was, was uh, top of mind or, or, you know, it was interesting how vendor lock-in was very prevalent in Europe. And I'm, you know, I'm not surprised given sort of the broader landscape uh, sort of, of conversations around cloud providers and and sort of uh, you know digital sovereignty. So it, it seemed to sort of show that preventing vendor lock-in, you know, open source is one of the main goals to prevent vendor lock-in. Um, another area that I think sort of puts together two results um, from the from the report, um, you know, clearly most of the respondents saw the power of open source to sort of survive. Uh, political seasons, if that makes sense. I mean, uh, particularly in the U.S., we're very much on the on a four-year schedule for whatever happens uh, and has to happen. Uh, um, and and folks really saw, uh, at least that's my interpretation. Interested from from Colin and Hillary, I'll clearly spend more time on that. Um, that certainly they see the value and they would recommend more investment in, in uh, open source from the public sector to really foster a vision that is very ambitious, you know, the one of the, the digital commons. On the other hand, what it seemed to me is that transparency was the first and foremost reason why the government thinks it needs to do sort of open source. And don't get me wrong, transparency is absolutely a, 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 a key tenet of open source, and it's something that the government and regulators should strive for. But it seemed to me that uh, it's not the whole story, meaning we have seen over and over again, putting together collaborations, like using the convening power of the government to bring together all the different constituents to actually then use open source to solve, you know, let's not call it a business problem in this case, but a social uh, issue or a policy issue. And so clearly transparency, it's great. <laughs> we all should be happy about that. And then the public sector sort of diving deep into that, but I think they're not really, um, at least from my interpretation of the results, they're not really taking major advantage of the full power of open source. Some of the collaborations that we've seen uh, globally under, under the Linux Foundation, under other foundations. 
Um, and then the third one, yes, uh, this is one of the key uh, results, and it talks about the, the sort of the delta between the consumption and the contribution policies. Um, and that's where maybe I have a slightly different um, experience with the concept of OSPOs. For me, OSPOs kind of gets me to the next one. Um, historically, I've interacted with OSPOs more on the how, meaning on the procedural side. How do you do open source on the policy side? Uh, how do you engage? How do you contribute? How do you consume? Maybe, again, this is more from the finance world where it all starts with compliance, it all starts with legal, and just recently they're starting to understand the strategic value of open source, especially sort of on an uh, outward-facing uh, 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 um, open source initiatives. And so, again, in the assumption that the OSPO, as I see it, it's more about the how, I do think, from my experience in finance, that it starts actually with the why. So we go back to sort of strategic leadership. In my mind, it all starts from getting the leadership to understand why they would want to do open source, and that will make, you know, rolling out proper policies sort of much easier. Again, we try to do that with banks from the other side. <laughs> it's, it's been pretty complex to just do open source for open source sake in some of these organizations. Um, and so, yes, my uh, sort of operational hypothesis is that we need to do more education on sort of the full value of open source beyond sort of code collaboration, on, on government bringing together some of this collaboration or being part of it, and on the role of foundations, not just the Linux Foundation, in, in sort of bringing all the different constituents together. Um, again, it'll be my personal bias, but I do think there is a much you know, if you compare Europe to, to other regions, there's sort of less tech prevalence or sort of big tech uh, versus strong vertical industries. And as you've seen, pretty much all the industries are over 50% in sort of understanding their value of open source. But if I, if I cross-reference that with sort of the um, contribution to the European GDP, meaning what are the most important industries in Europe, it seems to me that this is you know, together we're working with the public sector, sort of a second major area for us to, to sort of uh, develop uh, in Europe. And again, it's no surprise that foundations like LF Energy, OS Climate, uh, uh, Finos are, are pretty strong in Europe. Um, and then, last but not least, uh, I think it has come up. We didn't touch much about the romantic nature of open source uh, that I sort of hinted to this morning. Uh, but it did, you know, I think we all know <laughs> as Europeans, <laughs> but it was important for me to have a validation from a data-driven perspective that there is a, a different view from individuals, whether you are a contributor, whether you are an end user, whether you are a, just a citizen, we want to make sure that whatever comes out, uh, both the participation is a level playing field and whatever comes out delivers value, not just, you know, to corporations or governments, but really to the ultimately uh, individuals. And what are we doing on time? Okay, so you've seen this slide this morning. I'm just going to skip on it. Uh, um, I hope, I was just quoting an article from a couple of months ago, um, and that's really something that I hope, back to that idea of marrying the three different aspects of, of the romantic nature, the, the commercial nature, and the sort of social value, um, kind of going back to that, we think foundations can actually play an important role in bringing those three values together. And it was interesting to me to see uh, this article, was that two months ago, uh, where, you know, in order to actually implement the uh, sort of vision of the digital commons, there's been some, you know, conversations around actually sort of launching a, a foundation. Um, you know, of course, it would be very supportive, very happy to help. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, hopefully, sort of, we can see uh, the need and the demand converge with, you know, hopefully what we can uh, support with through Linux Foundation Europe. Um, and then one final, maybe not necessarily related to the survey, um, operational hypothesis. Uh, a lot of people ask me whether <laughs> I'm going to move back to Europe uh, in the last day or so. And, you know, 
sure, that's the goal. Um, but just, well, this was, I think you shared, Hillary, a month ago, this article. Actually, the EU just opened a, uh, uh, an office in San Francisco. So I feel like m I got something more to do there first uh, before actually uh, moving, moving to Europe. Um, but I do think, again, this goes kind of more broadly into the type of things that we hope to be able to bridge, you know, uh, uh, with this current administration in the US, certainly the relationships have improved in terms of, of sort of transatlantic collaboration. You know, clearly there's a lot of <laughs> um, animosity between Europe, big tech, West Coast, but the fact that EU is, you know, trying to sort of to be there either to you know, keep an eye on <laughs> or to, to sort of build bridges, I think it's, it's a good sign and we sort of want to um, support that. And I see five minutes, so... <laughs> no, <laughs> no Brexit jokes. <laughs> I've, I've been advised to stay away from Brexit jokes. <laughs> as much as Colin, you... You know how much I love Brexit jokes. You know that. Uh, I've been very, I've been I think probably advised to stay away from Brexit jokes. Um, also because again, I left Europe, not I left you. It's the whole Europe. We, yeah, we, we still love you. We still love you, Colin. That's, that's the thing. And so these are just a couple of questions. I know we only have five minutes, so I, I, I actually, I added the second question that you probably didn't know, Hillary. Uh, oh, you did it, good. Um, great, uh, sorry, I didn't have a lot of time for Google Docs comments this morning. Uh, but um, we don't have to answer these questions right now. We're actually uh, uh, gonna spend some time to, to understand, especially the second one, you know, what areas of collaboration should we prioritize? It's, it's a pretty loaded question and ones that I don't know that we're gonna respond now. But I just wanted, I don't know, if you had a different format for ending this conversation, but I'd love to hear from you uh, uh, whether you have any thoughts on these questions, on the survey results, on the interpretation. Again, this has been really the last few days. Please. Um, oh, maybe. So a, a few years back, the, there was the Digital uh, Copyright Act that was been legislation being put through the EU. And the, there was an ME, a German MEP who was saying that can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah, so th there was a German MEP who was saying there's a lot of things, a lot of problematic things with this. Um, uh, uploading code to GitHub could be affected by this and so on. So I ha had a chat with my local MEP and said, uh, this is problematic for th these reasons. And he said, okay, we're going to box that off. You know, that'll be okay. But looking at the legislation, it struck me that with, with, with all of the tech expertise I have, yeah. I did not have the time or the interest to get my head into the code that is, you know, legislation. So it, it, it strikes me that if somebody is into that, they wouldn't have the time to understand our stuff. So how do they come to understand our stuff? <laughs> Given that they have enough to be getting on with understanding their own stuff. Yeah. And manage to get this carve out. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, so indeed, I mean, that came in as a, as the result of a last minute fight, you know, so it was definitely not part of the original uh, legislation and not part of their, you know, it was not, you know, in the mind of the, the drafters of the legislation. And so, you know, together with FSFE and others, we, we did a sort of campaign to save code share campaign um, and basically managed to get this carve out, which basically just says this should not apply to, you know, uh, or is not meant to apply to uh, you know, co yes, exactly. But I don't think that the, the legislation, the text, actually shows an understanding of 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 uh, you know of this type of platform. It's just that they we had convinced enough legis uh, legislators that you know open source uh, contributors you know contributed value, and that they should not be in scope. Um, and so you know, so it, it is was an example of you know uh, a little bit of the re reactive um, lobbying, let's say, and hopefully we can be more proactive, yeah. you know, with, with, with LF Europe and, and some of the research that we are, that we are seeing here today. I, 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 somebody said one minute. Yeah, well, I, was, I was just going to point out, a lack of understanding is, is, is at the root of quite a lot of the challenges. As you probably know, Gab, 
Gab heads up Finos, I pre predominantly work in financial services and a lot of the challenges we face, which are not, not legislative, but uh, within, or, within organizations, legal and compliance get in the way of contribution for fear of leaking IP. That, to my mind, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to commit a, a fix to a bug on, on GitHub. So yeah, it, it, the, the root there is a lack of understanding. Actually, are out of time. Um, I, I will have to wrap this conversation with very many thanks to all of you for joining and invite you all to please get in touch with us to discuss the research. Europe at LinuxFoundation.org. Uh, you can reach out to Gab. Lin even better, LinuxFoundation.eu. Um, uh, or reach out to me and we'll be glad to carry on this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>